everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is a legend in the plant-based world. I know you know him. His name is Dr. Neil Barnard, and he has a new book coming out any day now. Well, not any day. It's in two months, but that's any day now. Right around my birthday, too. What a great gift for me. Please welcome Dr. Neil Barnard. It's so good to see you. It has been far too long. Great to see you, AJ. Yeah. So what, you've written like 17 books, haven't you? Oh, something like that. Sure. Wow. How, how do you have time? <laughs> well, you know, it, it is an important thing because you really have to make sure that what you're saying is well-researched and that it's, um, uh, that everything's accurate. And also you want to make sure that if you're talking about foods and recipes, that they're all carefully tested and they're fun and that people really like them. And that's what this is really all about because the, the point of the book uh, which I've called the power foods diet is about foods that cause weight loss. In other words, it's not about not eating or starving or denying yourself. It's about certain foods that actually cause weight loss. And we're going to build them into our routine and watch the pounds melt away. Well, I'm sure people want to know what that is, especially this time of year. We recently had Dr. Doug Lyle on and he said that the number one personal goal, at least in the United States, is weight loss. And I, I feel like the obesity rates just keep climbing. You said it. It's everybody's big preoccupation. And that's really what motivated me to write this is because people do the wrong things. They hurt themselves. They decide, I'm just not going to eat anything. And then they starve and that slows their metabolism and it can be really rough. Or they'll go ketogenic and their weight goes down and their cholesterol goes up. Um, or they'll do all kinds of kooky things. Or they'll, they'll go Mediterranean thinking, well, everyone says it's good, but then it doesn't work for them very well because Mediterranean diets just aren't so hot for weight loss. And people tend to blame themselves. So we're going to try to get all that negative stuff off and bring some positive stuff in. And that's all about eating the foods that love you back. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait. Do you, I, I, do you have a cover at least to show us? I'd love to see what it looks like. Yeah, let me let me show you one. Um, how about if I give you a little um, two minute introduction to the book? And at the end of that, I'll show you what the book looks like. Fantastic. Is that good? Sounds okay. good. Can I share my screen? Oh, please do. Okay. okay, this is a blueberry. I hope you can see my blueberry there, AJ. And Beautiful. there's a whole bunch of blueberries. And the reason that I'm showing these blueberries is that back in 2015, researchers from Harvard published this study. This will not be on the test, but here's what they were looking at. It was researchers at Harvard looking at over 100,000 people in the nurses' health study, health professionals' follow-up study, and they tracked them for a good long time, 24 years. But what they looked at was what they ate, particularly changes in fruit intake, changes in vegetable intake over time, and changes in body weight. And then they put the two and two together to see if people ate more of this, did they lose weight? If they ate more of that, did they gain weight? What was the story? Well, there were a whole bunch of foods that seemed to be associated with weight loss. And the number one weight loss food was berries. Wow. Yep. And that could be blueberries. Could also be something like strawberries. And it could even be blueberries inside a muffin, um, depending on what else gets baked into that muffin. But here's the deal. Inside blueberries, that dark blue color comes from anthocyanins. And anthocyanins are one of nature's pigments and they're in blueberries. There's a related anthocyanin that gives strawberries. They're kind of uh, dark red color. And in the autumn, the leaves are colored by other anthocyanins, but what they all have in common is that they're antioxidants. And researchers in the UK, two years after the Harvard study said, let's look in more detail. And what they did, they published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They brought in twins, almost three thousand twins, AJ. Yeah, don't try this at home. And it was called the Twins UK Registry. And what they did is everyone got a DEXA scan that allows you to look at abdominal fat, thigh fat, body composition overall. And through the DEXA scan, what they discovered is of the twins, the twin pairs, the one who had the higher anthocyanin intake, that's blueberries, strawberries, raspberries. The one who had the higher anthocyanin intake had about 9% less abdominal fat. Now keep in mind, these are genetically identical people. 
but they're not identical if they're eating differently and more anthocyanins cause weight loss. So strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, there's even anthocyanins that give pears that are little blush grapes. Okay, fair enough. But it's not just berries, cinnamon. Researchers started looking at cinnamon and they found a compound which they called, they gave it this kind of kooky name. It's an aldehyde. So they named it a cinnamaldehyde. Um, and what they discovered is that it increases metabolism. Inside your intestinal wall, you have a receptor called the TRPA1 receptor. Sitting there in your intestinal wall, the cinnamaldehyde comes down, attaches to it. And when it does, it increases adrenaline in your blood, which boosts your metabolism just a little bit. So researchers thought, well, wait, 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 wait. If I'm eating this and it increases my metabolism, that means weight loss, right? Well, will it? Researchers published a study and they did a randomized trial, 2017, 116 people in it. They gave them three grams of cinnamon, which is about a teaspoon per day. And over a 16 week period, they saw weight loss, about not quite eight pounds in the intervention group. Now that's impressive. And I have to say, when I first saw this, I was skeptical. I thought it's too easy. But a whole, many, many studies have been done finding much the same kind of result. And then hot peppers, uh, you might've had the experience, AJ, of you're sitting at a restaurant and your jalapeno burrito comes and you have just a few extra jalapenos and you start to feel hot. Well, it's not just hot on your tongue, your body temperature actually does increase a little bit. And that's due to capsaicinoids, which are the hot in hot peppers. They also reduce the appetite, but they increase your calorie burning speed. And that's true whether they're pickled or, or raw or whatever the heck it may be. So I got all excited about this. And AJ, here's my book, The Power Foods Diet. The goal wow. was to look not just at blueberries and not just at cinnamon and not just at hot peppers, but there are dozens of foods that if you build them into your routine, each one has a slight weight loss effect. And so I worked with Dustin Harder whom you know, and Lindsay Nixon, whom you know, and the great, just terrific recipe developers. And Dustin and Lindsay came up with more than 120 recipes. And the whole idea is if you eat more of these foods, you're going to lose weight. And they are out of this world. So Dustin came up with a blueberry syrup and Lindsay came up with some French toast and you put the two together and it's just delicious. And it's super, super, super easy. I don't want people to think you got to be a junior chef. Take some blueberries, they can be frozen blueberries, fresh, a little vanilla extract, a little cinnamon, throw, throw that in there too, a little maple syrup if you want, pour it over the top of your French toast, which is easy to make too. And when your friends are coming over, you know, this is not diet food. Let's put some uh, vanilla extract in there, some mints. Yes, they're going to lose weight if they eat this way, but you want people to feel like this is delicious food. So let the weight come off, let the health come back but do it in a really delicious way. And Dusty came up with a triple berry sorbet, which is blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, a few bananas in there for kind of substance, just a little cranberry juice or cherry juice, a little maple syrup, or th these are the funnest things, especially if you had kids coming over, they're blueberry pops. Super easy, some blueberries, some bananas, some pears, and a little almond milk and a spritz of lemon juice, so fun. So uh, also in the Power Foods Diet, I'm, I'm gonna walk people through not just recipes that are uh, really easy, don't require any preparation. I have some recipes that are elegant when you're entertaining and a lot that are kind of in between where if you like to, to make something nice, you can do that. So er everywhere from convenient to more complex. But I also want people to know how to use these foods. Some people haven't really thought about it. So I'm gonna say, when you go to the store, don't get the shriveled up, dried up blueberries, get the really plump ones with a little gray dusting. And here, you don't have to get it organic for everything, but for blueberries, I want you to get it organic. And there's a reason. If you are buying a banana and the banana was sprayed with pesticides, well, you're not gonna eat the, the peel. Same with an orange, you're not gonna eat that. But with a blueberry, you are not peeling your blueberries. So um, whatever is sprayed on the outside, you're gonna get. So buy the organic ones. Do not put them on the countertop. They're gonna shrivel up quickly. Store them in the fridge, but do not wash them. Don't wash your blueberries until you're re just ready to eat them. Because if you wash them the day you buy them and they stay in there for three days, they're gonna get a little bit of moldiness on them from the water. Don't do that. Uh, frozen, fine. Very convenient, very healthy. And when you're turning them into muffins, please 
Don't add butter. Don't add greasy stuff. With cinnamon, the one you want to get is Ceylon cinnamon. Do not get Chinese cinnamon, Indonesian cinnamon, Saigon cinnamon. You, you, you can, but they're not true cinnamon. They're, it's it's a, a cousin called cassia. And there's some, some possibility of toxicity when you're having higher amounts. Once again, organic makes sense with cinnamon in particular. Store it out tight, keep it in a dry, cool place, and you're going to be fine. So that's the power of foods. So let me unshare, and we can talk more about it. That is, oops, my, I turned my camera. Well, <laughs> oh, I love your picture. That's <laughs> that, I, I can't wait for the book to come out. The recipes sound fantastic. But you're not suggesting that if somebody just eats, you know, blueberries with French toast, if they're following the standard American diet eating lots of animal products and oils, that that in itself will help them lose weight. No, I, that is what I would say. I'm saying that that in itself will help them lose Seriously? weight. Seriously? But you want them to yeah. change a little bit further, don't you, then from eating the standard American diet and adding blueberries. AJ, you are reading my mind. Exactly. So each one of these helps chip away. The effect of blueberries, the effect of cinnamon, the effect of, of hot peppers, and there are many, many others. Each one of them is a piece of it, but you can completely undo that benefit. Let's say you take your French toast and you have a big hunk of pork sausage next to it. That's, not, that's going to really undo the benefit. So it's also important to know the things that are working against you. But there are really three ways that these foods work. And the first one is that they're appetite tamers. Uh, there are, we did a study where we looked at people who were just following a totally plant-based diet. So you're eating vegetables, you're eating fruits, you're eating grains, you're eating beans. What do they have in common? They've all got a lot of fiber. Fiber has almost no calories, but it's very filling. And so over time, what you see is that people's appetites get tackled by the high fiber foods. If instead you were eating Velveeta or organic salmon that you got at Whole Foods, well, however they may market it, it's got zero fiber. So by the time you get filled up with it, you know, you've gotten a lot, quite a lot of calories. So the first thing is their appetite tamers. The second is a discovery that some re researchers at Tufts did, did that was really quite amazing. They brought in individuals and they found that if you ate a lot of fiber, high fiber foods, it actually, the fiber actually traps calories in your digestive tract and carries those calories out with your waste. What I'm saying is you're actually flushing calories down the toilet. What they did is they brought in, in volunteers. Half of them went on the white bread diet. They got um, white bread, white rice, things where the fiber had been removed. And then the other half of the people got the high fiber diet, brown rice, whole grain bread, things that had the fiber intact. And they actually took fecal samples, don't try this at home, and they measured how much of their energy, how much of the calories in the food went right through their bodies and ended up in the toilet without getting absorbed. And what they found is that when you eat a high fiber food, some of the calories in your digestive tract get grabbed by the fiber. It carries it out of the body. You can't absorb those calories. And that change alone is good for about 100 calories loss every day. And the third thing, after I've tamed your appetite, after I've trapped your excess calories, the third thing is that I want to boost your metabolism. And your metabolism increases after a meal, not if you eat butter, not if you eat grease. Those do not boost your metabolism. But if you have healthy, complex carbohydrates and plant-based proteins, you can get a boost in your metabolism. It's good for about 200 calories a day. So back to your question, AJ, is, is this going to cause weight loss? Each part alone does its bit. 100, cal 100 calories, 150 calories of calorie trapping, 200 calories at burning after the meal. You could cut your appetite by easily two or 300 calories a day. You feel the same. You feel great. You feel full after each meal, but you are losing weight because you're, tra you're trapping calories, you're taming your appetite, and you're burning calories faster. And that takes care of it. Well, sign me up. Well, actually, I don't need to lose weight, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean. I mean, it, it sounds amazing. What about keeping fats and oils on the lower side? Because I've heard you had conversations about that before, at least when I've, I've interviewed you before, at least for people that want weight loss. Yeah, uh, I, it's, a, it's an important thing. Um, all fats, all oils have nine calories in every single gram. Now, not all oils are created equal. If you have coconut oil, 
It's really high in saturated fat. It is going to make your arteries narrow. It'll raise your cholesterol levels. And I don't care how well they market coconut fat or palm oil. They'll say, oh, they're natural. You know, I got it at the health food store, da, 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 da. These things have a lot of saturated fat in it. It's going to raise your cholesterol. However, let's say I get extra virgin olive oil. It's much lower in saturated fat. Instead of being, what, 80 some percent saturated fat like coconut fat, it's down to 14. However, even though it's lower in saturated fat, extra virgin olive oil is not one bit lower in calories. It'll still fatten you up just like coconut oil. So uh, we're going to keep all oils really, really low. And so when Dustin and Lindsay made their recipes, they're not adding oils to these things. You can make foods absolutely delicious without any adding any of that stuff at all. It's a lighter flavor and one that people really appreciate. That is great. I, and it would be so fun to be in one of your studies. How does, if somebody lives in Washington, D.C., can they participate? Well, we're doing studies all the time. We're, we're launching a new study now with type, for people with type 2 diabetes. And they come in and we're measuring uh, a number of things in their bodies. And uh, the usual things, we're looking at their dietary intake and their weight and their cholesterol. But as you may remember from our previous conversations, we found that what causes diabetes type two diabetes. It starts as insulin resistance, which comes from fat buildup inside our cells. And we can actually measure that with something called magnetic resonance scanning. And so you look inside their muscles and look inside their liver cells and you see that they're filled with fat particles. Then we change their diets. If it's a plant-based diet, a vegan diet, there isn't any animal fat in it at all. And if I keep oils low, then the fat in their cells starts to dissipate. And that's what we're doing. So the point is that this kind of diet doesn't just help you lose weight, but it helps tackle diabetes and so many other health conditions. Right. So, you know, I think it gets confusing because as you mentioned earlier, people do these keto diets, which are very high in fat and they lose weight. And so people wonder, well, maybe that's the way to go because they seem to result in fast, but not permanent weight loss. Uh, some people lose weight with them. Some people don't. Um, there's, oh, really? there's a Okay. Well, there's a long there's a long line of disappointed Atkins dieters out there, um, people who who tried it for a little bit, it didn't work for them, and they, you know, you, you go into any thrift shop, you'll see a whole lot of those books that have been just um, turned in, and people have given up on it. However, th th I don't mean to say that that some people don't lose weight on it; they will, because the the carbohydrate blaming approach says that carbs made you fat. So don't eat an apple and don't eat a banana and don't eat an orange and don't eat a pear and don't eat any, any bread and don't eat any rice and don't eat noodles. And carbohydrates are 50 or 60% of what you eat. So if you take all that away, you will lose weight. The problem is that what's left for your average meat eater, once you've taken away all the starchy foods, what's left is meat and gravy and not very healthy foods. Their, their overall calorie intake is less. But what's left is not very healthy. So their cholesterol levels in many cases will go up. Yeah, absolutely. And this way of eating is just to me so much more satisfying. I, I mean, it's been almost 50 years for me. I can't imagine eating just a bunch of meat and fat. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, for many people, it's a new thing. And so we have to help people to figure out how to begin it in, in a good way. And what we'll often do is... Um, for a person who's totally new to it, they may be 50 or 60 years old, and they thought, you know, I really want to re reach my health goals, but I'm not sure about what how a vegan diet would work. How do I start? What we'll typically do is encourage them to take a week. And during that week, take a piece of paper and just write down breakfasts and lunches and dinners, things that have no animal products in them, but that you actually would eat. So let's say I'm having cornflakes in the morning now with milk, Mm, how do I veganize that? Well, I put on almond milk or soy milk or something like that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, or I could have a bowl of oatmeal instead, or I could have my waffle recipe or whatever it might be. Um, or if I'm having Jimmy Dean pork sausage, that's an animal product, but the store has Morningstar veggie sausage. Very good, low in fat. You know, it may be a little processed, but it doesn't have any cholesterol and no, no oink in it, no moo in it. And we'll give that to you. So after about a week, people have a list of vegan things that they really enjoy. And then what we often encourage them to do is take three weeks now and eat those foods. Let's go completely vegan. But if it's only three weeks, I mean, you can do anything for three weeks. 
And so people really commit to it. Plus they've already got their list of foods they like. And at the end of three weeks, AJ, people's lives have transformed. They've already started to lose weight, even though it's just been 21 days. Their blood sugar has come down. Their energy is better. And the second thing that happens is their tastes have changed because they haven't been eating greasy foods. They really come to prefer the, the healthy tastes that they're having now. Well, it's already a bestseller in, on Amazon, and I've been putting the link for pre-order in the chat and the show notes. So I'm sure it's going to do very well. And we have a question from a live viewer about the blueberries. Do they have to be the wild blueberries and do they have to be organic to work? Okay, well, thank you. Um, they work whether they're organic or not. Um, what we believe is is doing the, the the good here is those anthocyanins, which there are there in the non-organic varieties too. Plus the fact that they there's not much fat. You can't really squeeze a lot of fat out of a blueberry, um, and it's high in fiber. However, the reason I encourage you to get organic. Yeah, it may cost a buck more or something like that at the store, but the reason I favor organic when it comes to berries is that, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier, let's say you go to the store and you get an orange and the orange is not organic, meaning they sprayed the orange grove with, with pesticides. When you get the orange, what do you do? You peel the outer surface off of it and you throw it away. Now, if you get a blueberry, do you peel that? No, you don't. You're gonna eat the whole thing. So if there are pesticides on the surface, you're not gonna get them from your orange because you peeled it, but you will get them from the blueberry. So I would encourage you to get organic if you can't get organic and blueberry, or you're unsure because you're at a restaurant, um, it's better to have the blueberries than not to have them, but the, but the organic ones are always the best. Thank you. Uh, Monique, who's watching live says, is it okay to use coconut oil for oil pulling? Or? Oil pulling. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe you could, it's something. I don't know about oil pulling, but I'm going to tell you what you can use coconut oil for. You remember I said it's going to raise your cholesterol? It'll raise it a lot. It can easily put 10 points on your cholesterol level. So here's the legitimate uses of coconut oil. You can make a candle on it. You can put it in your hair. You can wax your car with it and wax your shoes. And that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dixie says, do you consider potatoes a weight loss food? Yeah, I do. Um, surprisingly enough, because potatoes get a little bit of a bad rap. People say, oh, you know, that's just junk food. What they're thinking of is the person took an innocent potato and they cut it into little <laughs> slivers and threw it in hot grease. And out it came as potato chips and they salted it up. So it's got a lot of salt. It's got a lot of grease. That innocent potato is now really a bystander for processing. But the potato itself is a healthy root vegetable. Let me cheerlead for the potatoes in a couple of ways. Number one, it's got a lot of fiber in it. It's got a lot of clean, uh, complex carbohydrates, which is great for energy. And write this down. There is more protein in a large potato than there is in a large egg. The egg industry will tell you, oh, eggs are a great source of protein. You go to the store or go online and you look at a large egg. It's got maybe five or six grams of protein in it. Look at a large potato. It's got about seven grams of protein in it. So pro uh, eggs, uh, um, potatoes are a great healthful food. The real issue is what goes on it. What happens where I grew up in North Dakota, you took this beautiful baked uh, potato, you put it in the oven, you took it out, we cracked it open, put butter, sour cream, cheese doodles, bacon bits. You got to look around. Wasn't there a potato in here eventually, you know, before? Those fatty toppings are what kill us. Uh, but the potatoes itself, potato itself is fine. You might remember the comedian Penn Gillette, who was, he, was, he had a big weight issue. And he thought, I want to take this weight off. And he ate almost nothing but potatoes and lost weight. And he's not the only one. Other people have done it too. You want a variety of plant-based foods. You want vegan foods in the whole rainbow that nature came up with. But potatoes should be part of it. They're, they're terrifically healthy. Right. Uh, Monique clarified that oil pulling is swishing oil in your mouth for 20 minutes. Apparently, it's good for mouth health. It would seem like she'd still absorb some of it. Uh, new one on me. Um, but let, if... You might find that the oils leave a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth when I tell you this. Um, let's say I take an olive. An olive has traces of oil in it. No big deal. Um, it's not a huge amount. How many olives can you eat? 
Well, think about it. Did you ever eat one olive at a sitting or two or three? Yeah, you might have. Did you ever eat 12 or 13? Now you're kind of pushing it. Well, let's say I have a factory and I take 10,000 olives and I press all the oil out of it and I stick it in a bottle and I call it olive oil. Even if you use a nice seductive word like virgin on it, it's still a refined product in the sense that you have thrown away all the fiber, thrown away all the pulp, you've thrown away the whole olive, except for that oil, it's now concentrated calories. And that's why when our research team did a study of the Mediterranean diet, which favors some, some healthy foods. I mean, there's vegetables in it and fruits in it and so forth, but there's some chicken in there, some fish, and often a lot of olive oil. In a 16 week trial, we found that people who wanted to lose weight, but went Mediterranean really didn't lose weight effectively at all. And it's because of the animal fat that's in the fish and the chicken, little bits of cheese they're eating and the, uh, the olive oil as well. So I would really view oils, including olive oil, including coconut oil, including all of them as refined foods that nature didn't bring you. A factory brought that to you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one of the viewers on Instagram is asking how they can be a subject in one of your studies. They are a type two diabetic. Oh, well, thank you. Um, if you go to our website, pcrm.org, and you'll see research studies listed there. We are just now actually recruiting for a diabetes study, as I mentioned earlier. This one is in Washington, D.C. We sometimes do have studies for people who are in other locations. Um, this one's in Washington, D.C., but if, if you're there and you've got type 2 diabetes, we'd love to talk to you. That is great. You know, it, people are still, you know, you've written so many books and so so many other books from the plant-based doctors and documentaries, but people still are afraid of carbs. I, it's, it's, it's so strange to me that I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Dr. Walter Kempner. I had two of the doctors that work with him on the show and I, it, people that just eat white rice lose weight. I, I don't get why people still are so afraid to eat complex carbohydrates. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of mysteries. I mean, many people imagine if they, they pray to God that their, their high school football team is going to win the game. People have all kinds of ideas about things that, that uh, may not actually work out so well in the long run. Um, and this idea that carbohydrates are something to be avoided or fats are to be revered. Those are, are things that are a bit mythological. Our team has put these to the test. And what we find is that when we increase carbohydrates, um, by that I mean, I, I'm, what I'm talking about is healthy fruits, healthy vegetables, including starchy vegetables like carrots and potatoes, um, or beans, noodles, they lose weight very, very easy. And our mathematician friends will show why. A gram of carbohydrate, does it have the same calories as oil? No, a gram of oil, a gram of fat, a gram of butter has nine calories. A gram of carbohydrate has all of four. And by the way, that's true not just for starches, that's even true for pure sugar. If you took packed sugar, I'm not suggesting you should do that because it's highly refined as well, but it only has four calories in it as well. So carbohydrates are among your best friends. Thank you. Marcy, who's watching live, wants to know how long does it take to notice weight loss on a plant-based diet? Well, it starts on the first day. Um, now, I don't encourage people to really try necessarily to lose weight super fast. If you're, let's say it took you a long time to, to gain weight and you were gaining maybe a pound or two per year. Well, let's say you lose a pound a week. Um, after a year, that's about 50 some pounds. That's pretty good. So typically the weight loss will begin on day one, but we want it to, to act. For, I would encourage people to go for about maybe even a half a pound or a pound per week. Just let it gently come off. You don't have to starve yourself to make it happen extra fast. Right. I think that's a lot of times people want it very quickly and they, they give up because it doesn't come as quickly as they want. Yes, but you know that's the beauty of a plant-based diet because with this kind of diet, it's not really effort. It's not that you're starving it off and feeling hungry and miserable all the time. And it's not that you're feeling a need to exercise it off. Exercise is great, but the foods themselves, if they're carefully chosen, will do the weight, do the weight loss for you. Yeah, fantastic. This question was uh, said to us in advance when Melanie knew you were going to be on the show. And she said, she's looked forward to reading your new book. I've been posting the link. You guys can pre-order it from the chat or the show notes. And she said she heard a local doctor say that in general, one should never take B12 alone. It must also be taken with always be taken with all the B vitamins, like in a B complex pill. What are your thoughts on this? I never heard. That. Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's a terrific question. 
Um, the beauty of it is that B12 is very highly absorbed, whether it's taken with other things or not. So it's okay, it's okay to take it alone. Um, and even people who are up in years um, and who are not absorbing B12 from food, they're, they've been an omnivorous diet and they're running low on B12 because they're not absorbing it very well anymore. Uh, when they take it as a supplement, the absorption is really very strong. So it's, it's going to be fine either way. Thank you. Uh... Sure. Okay. Oh, this is not about weight loss, but um, Marlene, who's watching live, would like to know, should I take replacement hormones for better health during and after menopause? Oh, my goodness sakes. Um, what an important question. Thank you so much for raising that. You know, many women at around age 50, when they reach menopause, are hit by hot flashes. Um, and you feel kind of terrible. Um, you're sitting in your board of directors meeting, making a presentation, and suddenly it's as if the room turns on fire. Um, and, or you're trying to sleep and every two or three hours you wake up in a pool of sweat and hot flashes can really be uncomfortable. And so doctors then will often recommend hormone replacement therapy. And their idea is that nature forgot to keep you signed up for estrogens after about age 50. And so if you just swallow it or put it on a patch, that those extra hormones will make you feel better. The problem, well, there are many problems with this. One is, um, there's substantial evidence that, uh, women taking hormones are at increased risk of certain kinds of cancer. And recently, the question of increased risk of dementia has been batted around. And some data said, no, it's, it's going to reduce the risk. But there have been two big studies that suggested an increased risk of dementia from people taking hormones. Um, by the way, I mentioned that at, at our conference on August 15th, the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine in Washington, D.C. Uh, we will be having these researchers there sharing these data. So bottom line, uh, women need help if they've got hot flashes and have other symptoms. But in my opinion, taking hormone replacement pills is not the way to go about it. Uh, we did a research study where we brought in 84 women who were going through, who had gone through menopause and they had pretty bad hot flashes. And what we did drew on an interesting science, which is if you look around the world, you see that in some areas, people really didn't have much hot flashes. Women in rural Japan uh, prior to Westernization didn't really have much in the way of hot flashes uh, because their diet was more plant-based. People in rural Mexico didn't have much hot flashes as long as they were eating black beans and corn tortillas and not having much Western fare. So our intervention was three things. And if you have hot flashes, Here's what I'd re recommend you to do. Number one, no animal products at all. Just don't take this on faith, just try it. No animal products at all. Number two, keep oils extremely low. And I'll, I'll give you tips on how to cook without, without oils. Number three, have soybeans, mature soybeans, a half a cup of cooked soybeans per day. You can go on Amazon and you'll find, for example, uh, Laura brand, non-GMO soybeans, put them in your instant pot, cook them for 40 minutes and use them like a medicine. So a vegan diet, very scrupulously low oil and have a half a cup of cooked mature soybeans every day. And what we found is that the moderate to severe hot flashes dropped by 88%. Uh, for some women, it starts the first week. For many, it takes four or five weeks to, or maybe even longer to work. But that way you don't have the risks of hormone replacement therapy. If a woman is, wants to use um, some hormone replacement, perhaps for sexual functioning, because she has some vaginal dryness, in that case, you don't want a pill. You just use a local cream so that you're not using so much. That's what I was going to ask you, because I've had a lot of urologists on the show that really recommend either the UVFM or the esterase, which is uh, topical, not because they, they have a lot of science showing that it, it prevents UTIs, especially in people with chronic UTIs. And the, the beauty the beauty of that approach is you're using something local. You're not just swallowing it. Because the whole idea is not to treat your whole body. The part of part this idea is you're just treating the, the part of the body that 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 could benefit from it. Thank you. Annette says, should all the five foods you mentioned be eaten every day? Well, the the, the staples that you really want to have every day come in four groups: the fruits, the whole fruit group, the vegetable group, the bean group, as beans, peas, lentils and the whole grains. Have those every day, build your menu from those. Now, if you decide I'd like to have blueberries today, but tomorrow I'll have strawberries or I'll have raspberries, or maybe I won't have berries on that particular day. That's okay. The whole point of the power foods diet is that there are about 30 foods 
that are like blueberries, like cinnamon, like uh, the hot peppers that I mentioned, that they have a weight loss function. And my job is just to tell you, here's where they are. Here are some recipes that make them absolutely out of this world. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and you, you pick and choose and you put them to use as much or as little as you want to. And the, the weight loss comes more or less automatically. Great. Thank you. Uh, Farm Girl says that some people say that raw is better than cooked for health reasons, but I love and prefer my veggies cooked and don't mind eating more vegetables to starch to compensate for the extra calories. Is our raw, is raw better? Is raw more healing? Yeah, what a great question. Um, I have to say, I think there is something just to be said that raw would in theory be better. I mean, we did not evolve with sterno. So um, we presumably were eating raw vegetables and raw fruits for much of our time on earth. The problem is this, we don't know which ones those were. Um, for example, if a person has a salad and they have cut up tomatoes on their salad, a tomato is a North American food. Well, people are not originally from North America. People evolved in Eastern Africa and we got restless and we moved up and uh, went up into Europe and to Asia and over the Bering Strait and all different places and Europeans came and invaded and um, we've moved all around. Um, so the foods I'm going to suggest that the foods that were there in Eastern Africa when our species was more in its early years, those might be the raw foods our bodies are designed for, but we're not entirely sure which ones they are. The health value of cooked vegetables is very high. And in some cases, even higher. Uh, let's say if I have uh, tomatoes that are broken up and cooked a little bit, the lycopene that makes them red is liberated. That's an antioxidant. And there's actually more of it if the, if the, the, um, if the tomatoes are cooked. So cooked is fine. Uh, I'm, I, I do think it's good to include a, a fair amount of raw, veg raw vegetables, but some of them don't digest well. Broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, if you try to eat them raw, your tummy is going to give you a little bit of an issue. Yep. Someone's asking, is Beano safe for gas due to beans and legumes? I Googled it and it says it's not vegan, if that matters to someone. Yeah, well, um, there might be a more a simple approach. For a lot of people, when they greatly increase their bean consumption, their stomach will rebel a little bit. And that's because your sudden beans are the, start, are the fiber champions. There's fiber in whole grain bread. There's fiber in vegetables and fruits, but beans have more of it than anything. And so if suddenly your gut microbiome gets this huge importation of fiber, it ferments it and it makes gassiness. So the trick, the trick to it is number one, start small. A little bit of beans goes a long ways. Number two, make sure they are very well cooked. If you are cooking beans, don't have them be al dente. If they crunch, they're not a digestible. And sometimes when you get a can of beans and you open it up, some of the manufacturers cook them well and they're nice and soft. For others, they're, it's almost like they're giving you a can of peanuts. You don't want that. Um, and over time, what you'll discover, if you start small and have them well cooked, as time goes on, your, your gut microbiome will adjust. And you'll find that you might be a little bit better off with some varieties than others, but you'll be fine. Thank you. One of the viewers is asking, why do beans get a bad rap from a doctor who shall remain nameless? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, there, 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 are doc there, there is a doctor who talks about lectins in beans and goes on and on and on about the danger of it. Um, there are lectins um, in a lot of foods. You, you cook them and they're gone. Um, so I have no idea. Um, when you look in epidemiologic studies, people who eat more beans are, are healthy and in, are particularly healthy in a, a wide variety of ways. High fiber, zero cholesterol, no animal fat. Beans are health food. Thank you. I need uh, a good lot. <laughs> Mercy wants to know, are mushrooms good for us? You know, the one thing that mushrooms have gotten um, some notoriety for or some fame for, I should perhaps say, is, is cancer reduction. Uh, there have been a number of studies suggesting that women consuming more mushrooms um, have a reduction in breast cancer risk. Now, here is something where I think they should be cooked. Uh, if you gather a whole bunch of raw mushrooms, they have traces of formaldehyde in them, which disappear upon cooking. So if you want to put them in your vegan stroganoff, you go right ahead. Thank you. Monique says she really likes the recipes in your books, and she makes your bean-based waffle a lot. Oh, how nice. Thank you. Well, you are going to absolutely love the Power Foods diet. You know, 
when I worked with Lindsay, I worked with Lindsay on my previous book, um, uh, which is called Your Body and Balance and all about how hormones can be adjusted. And I worked with her again uh, in the Power Foods Diet, but I also worked with Dustin Harder, who works with the Physicians Committee as our, our culinary genius. And the two of them together came up with the most wonderful recipes, everything from salads and soups to main dishes and sides and desserts. And as I mentioned earlier, for the person who wants to cook, we have easy recipes. For a person who wants to kind of put on airs for their guests who are coming over, we've got some elegant recipes. But for the maybe 50% of people who say, for me, it's really got to be convenience. We have recipes and tips for people who really want to work, get in and out of the kitchen or do it at a fast food place, do it at the convenience store. So you may not be cooking at all. So we've got tips for everybody. And I want to say a big thank you to Dustin and to Lindsay for working with me on the Power Foods Diet. It's been, been really, really fun. And the response to it so far has been really great. Oh, fantastic. I can't wait to get my hands on it. But I see it's also available in Audible, and I tend to like to do that. Yep, yep. And, yeah. and no, it, I hope people enjoy that. And people need to know when you buy an Audible book, you still get the recipes, So just so you know. So that's, you know, I, we recently had Dr. Doug Lyle on, and there was a question, and I remember it now that we said, when when Dr. Barnard comes on, we're going to ask him, because somebody was asking about, because you, you, you talked about hormones so much in your previous book, that is the reason that... Uh, young girls are reaching puberty so much younger have anything to do with milk? It could well, um, and not just milk, but particular milk fractions like cheese. Um, this goes back a long ways. If you go back to say the mid 1800s or the early 1800s, girls were not reaching puberty at 11. Um, in some cases it was 17 or 18. Um, and it's gradually descended through the decades. And today it's not at all unusual for a girl of 11 or 12 or 13 uh, to be reaching puberty. And yet, if you think about it, wait a minute, why would you be reproductively fertile at 11? Because you're not ready to be a mother at 11. You can't raise a child and take on the responsibilities of adulthood. Why should you be sexually mature? And I don't think that that's what nature had in mind at all. Um, I think that th this is a change. And if you look at the diet back in 1909, the U.S. government tracked, started tracking what Americans eat. And in that year, the average American ate some cheese about 3.9 pounds per year. In other words, they might be eating it in Switzerland, but they're not eating it in Nebraska. Not very much. Cheese was not our thing. 3.9 pounds per year. Well, the U.S. government has been pushing U.S. foods, U.S. agricultural products, including cheese. And today, your average person does not eat 3.9 pounds of cheese in a year. We eat close to 40 pounds. That's good for about 70,000 calories worth of cheddar or brie or camembert or Velveeta or whatever your particular brand is. Um, and so along with all those calories comes estrogens. Uh, the cows, just to be a little bit um, graphic, if you don't mind, AJ, um, to get cheese or to get milk. Cows are not gonna automatically give you milk. A cow has to be impregnated. And on farms, they don't really particularly feel like getting pregnant. So what the farmers do is they chain them by the neck and they stick, the, the farmer sticks his left hand up the cow's rectum. And through the rectal wall, you can feel their uterus and you hold it steady with your right hand. You take what looks like a knitting needle and jam it through the cow's cervix and you inject semen you took from a bull. The cow is now pregnant. Nine months from now, she will give birth, and the male calves, of course, are taken away and killed for veal. Uh, the female calves are also taken away, and they're raised, uh, raised on milk replacer in isolation until they are ready to be impregnated. So mom is now, uh, she's, she was pregnant, she's now given birth, she's now lactating. And then within about three or four months, they'll impregnate her, her again. And the reason I'm telling you all this is she is making estrogen. And she's making more estrogen during her next pregnancy. And they've been milking her since she gave birth. They're milking her into the next pregnancy. They keep milking and milking and milking. And while she is now pregnant with her next calf, she is creating a lot of estrogen. It gets into the milk. The milk, it turns into cheese. It carries the estradiol, estrogens with it, estrone, estradiol, and others. And if you drink a glass of milk, if you have some yogurt, if you have some cheese, or if you give it to your seven-year-old daughter, or your eight-year-old son, the estrogens come right along with it. Will it affect them? 
there are the dairy industry says, no, no, it's not very much. It's just a trace of estrogen. It's, it's really not, not much. The fact of the matter is it's enough because your body already has all the estrogens that nature wanted you to have. And if you're adding more to it, this could be the reason why we have two big new research studies showing a link to breast cancer with dairy. We have changes in, uh, in uh, menstrual function, all kinds of other things. So getting away from dairy is one of the best gifts you can do for yourself and an even better gift you can do for your children. Thank you. Aditi says she can't afford organic. Is it okay to eat conventional produce? If, you, if you're in a place where conventional is all you get or all you can afford, by all means have it. It beats the heck out of Spam and Velveeta. Yeah, <laughs> true that. Thank you. All right, let's see. I was looking for some more. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, where can we find the bean-based waffle recipe, One asks Carolyn. Oh, thank you. I have to say, all of my books have lots and lots of recipes in them. And I hope that you'll take a look at, at all of them because they're, they're, they're really good. And I've worked with many different recipe developers. So this book is called The Power Foods Diet. This is the one that I think is, I think is probably the pinnacle of, of all of them. But the one just before that is the one we're talking about. Have a look. It's called um, Your Body in Balance. And it's about getting your hormones in balance, whether that hormone is insulin for diabetes or estrogen for cramps or menopausal symptoms or for men, erectile dysfunction or thyroid hormone, that kind of thing. Thank you. And yes, Karen, you do get the recipes. They're not printed for you, but there's a link anytime you buy Audible. That's the case in my book, any book that has recipes. And Clark asks, what does Dr. Barnard think of consuming ahi flower oil, corella powder, moringa powder, amla powder, which are often considered superfoods? Yes, I have to say, I am not an expert on, on really any of those. Um, uh, and so I, I don't think I would say anything very intelligent about any of them. Okay, thank you. And somebody's asking, what do you think of adding flax, chia, and hemp seed to your food? I think it's fine. Um, they are good sources of omega-3. Um, if you use enormous quantities, the fat content could actually build up. But let's face it, how much chia do you eat? How much flax do you eat? Maybe a spoonful. So it's perfectly fine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a question from an Instagram viewer. Are there some foods that can improve hypertension? Oh, all kinds of things. Sure. Um, things to include, things to get away from. The things to include, you already know, vegetables and fruits will reduce blood pressure. Part of the reason is that when fruits and vegetables grow out of the ground, they don't have a lot of sodium in them. Sodium raises blood pressure. Plants don't have a lot of it. What they do have is potassium that lowers blood pressure. They're loaded with it. So fruits and vegetables are good. What's not so good? You already know that sodium raises blood pressure. If you get away from salt, added salt, that's going to help. But here's the thing. It's not the salt you're adding at the table. The amount that you add at the table is trivial compared with the amount that they added in the kitchen or the amount they added at the factory. They took a can of green beans which had basically no salt in, and there's almost no sodium in the bean, but they put in a huge amount before they seal up that can because they know that makes it taste good. And that's true for canned soups and lots of other things. But the good news is that you can look for the low or no sodium varieties and you'll be fine. But the last thing I wanna mention is if you haven't yet gone vegan, do yourself a favor. Here's what happens. Your blood, your blood pressure is high. Um, when a person gets away from animal fat. There's not a lot of that waxy fat getting into your body. Your bloodstream, your blood flows more readily. Why? Because without that animal fat in it, the viscosity of the blood, the thickness of the blood diminishes. Your blood becomes, it flows like water instead of sort of sludging like grease. So when you get away from animal products, especially the cheese, the meats and so forth, your, your blood flows more readily and your blood pressure comes down. So put this all together. Have your vegetables and fruits. They are great. Get away from added uh, sodium added foods. Cheese is one of the worst. It's got a huge amount of sodium in it. Um, but when you get away from the cheese and the meat together, your blood viscosity goes down and your blood pressure is going to come down. All of this said, do not fire your doctor and don't throw your pills away. High blood pressure is dangerous. So your blood pressure is very likely to improve, but work with your doctor and reduce your medicines only when the doctor says, you're doing well, now is time 
time for us to slack off on your medicines. A great many people can reduce or eliminate their prescriptions, but uh, do, it in, do it in consultation with your doctor, not on your own. And speaking of doctor, you have the Barnard Medical Center now, so people can come in to see a wonderful plant-based doctor. Is that correct? And I don't know if you do any virtual visits. We do all kinds of it. Yes, the Barnard Medical Center. You'll see it uh, online, barnardmedical.org. And we've got terrific physicians and dietitians and, and others here in the clinic. And uh, we see people live and in person um, at our, our clinic on Wisconsin Avenue in Washington, D.C. But we do a lot of work with telemedicine. So let's say you're in San Francisco or let's say you're in L.A. or you're in New York or you're in Florida or wherever you are. Go on barnardmedical.org and you can make an appointment and we take most insurances. It's a nonprofit clinic, but we've got the greatest doctors and we love to help people out. That's great. Well, Dr. Jim Loomis now has a regular slot on my lineup, so we're very excited to, to welcome him. So a lot of the people are saying they appreciate you telling the truth about dairy, as, as sad as it is. So thank you for that. And, you know, while all your books are wonderful, I might say that my personal favorite is uh, Breaking the Food Seduction, because you're one of the few doctors, at least in the plant-based space, that really acknowledges food addiction. And I'm curious... What role do you think that plays in people's difficulty losing weight, even with the right foods sometimes? You know, some people might say, well, uh, you will find people occasionally who are really addicted um, to, to foods, almost like a drug. And you know what? I don't think that's true. I think what is true is that everybody can be addicted to foods like a drug, not just a few people. Everybody can. Why is that? Because there are foods that are being marketed very much in the same way as drugs. People will take something like chocolate or other things. And there are people working long into the night to figure out exactly the combination of sugar and cocoa butter that you cannot resist. Um, these things, salty snacks, all kinds of foods that people get hooked on, what they have in common is that they were not things that were there during our early evolution. Think about it. What do people get hooked on? Um, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, all these things did not exist early on. People didn't have a glass of wine until they figured out how to ferment grapes and then, uh, or things like tobacco. It took time for people to discover these things. And when they entered our cultures, we didn't have ways to defend ourselves against them. So you can have, um, you know, a terrific upbringing and so forth. You can still get hooked on foods. It's not your fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's not your upbringing. It's the foods themselves that are addictive as drugs. And unfortunately, we live in a culture now that brings them to you. Um, when I was a kid, we didn't have convenience stores on every corner. But nowadays, you'll find junk food at the gas station. All you want to do is fill your tank, but they want to sell you M&Ms, all kinds of other stuff. So that's, that's the world that we live in nowadays. Um, can people eat unhealthy foods every now and then and be okay? Sure they can. But if it's, got, if it's getting a life of its own, and your thighs are expanding before your very eyes, and you're feeling crummy, and your life is being ruined, and you're getting help... Uh, health problems, then that's the time to take stock and decide, do I want to break free? And my suggestion, this is going to sound un-American. I don't think moderation is such a great thing for everything. You know, there are some people who say, well, okay, let me just cut down. What you're doing is you're bargaining with it. Um, let's say, let's say your seven-year-old daughter likes to play the violin. And she's been playing the violin for about four hours now. And you say, sweetheart, you got to set the violin down because I know you got some homework and we're going to have dinner in a little bit. No, she said, all I want to do is play the violin. Well, violin is, is a healthy thing. And if she can moderate that, fair enough. What if all she likes to eat is broccoli? Well, great, that's healthy, but she's got to eat some other things too. Uh, moderation is important for broccoli. But when your daughter says to you, dad, how many cigarettes should I have? You say, not, you shouldn't have any. Well, but dad, you said moderation. Moderation applies to good things. You want some exercise. You don't want to exercise 24 hours a day. You want some. You want some broccoli, some fruits, some beans, some grains, moderate amounts of all these things. But if something is bad for you, you want it out of your life. Because what happens, unfortunately, is that small amounts kind of whisper in your ear and it becomes a larger amount and a larger amount and a larger amount. And pretty soon uh, you just really miss them when they're gone. And it's better not to tease yourself. Thank you. Uh, one of the Instagram viewers is asking if leafy greens can slow the progression of cataracts. You know, I don't think the answer to that is really known, but but leafy greens do, are rich in antioxidants and cataracts are uh, a, free, a 
the, the formation of free radicals inside the brain, uh, inside the eye in response to uh, ultraviolet light. Um, and there have been a couple of things that have contributed. We believe a high antioxidant diet is helpful. Um, however, we also have some evidence, surprisingly enough, that dairy may be a contributor. Um, I think we need more evidence on that, but that's an, another reason to avoid dairy. Thank you. Do you, Mara is asking if you have a dietitian at the Barnard Medical Center that can actually help with weight loss and help with building muscle mass. Yeah, we sure do. Um, yeah, if you go on barnardmedical.org, we can hook you up with dietitians. And AJ, I'm glad you asked me about this because we've set up a new service called the Preferred Dietitian Referral, PDR, Preferred Dietitian Referral. If you just Google that, preferreddietitianreferral.org, um, you will find dietitians who themselves are experts in plant-based diets and follow them themselves. I'm talking about a vegan diet. The reason we set it up is there are a lot of our doctors at the physician's committee who want to refer a patient to a dietitian so that the dietitian will help them adopt a vegan diet. But not all dietitians are very good with it. Some don't follow it. Some believe in other kinds of diets. We thought, wait a minute, we need a better referral. So we set up preferred dietitian referral to allow people to find a dietitian who they can work with right in their own state, who may be licensed to do telemedicine right where they are, and they can see them now. So PDR, a preferred dietitian referral.org. Thank you. I will I will add everything you've been talking about, the links to the show notes as soon as the show is over. And Stephanie, who's watching live, wants to know, what do you think about wheat germ and how would you add it to the diet? Uh, you can. You don't necessarily have to because if you're having whole wheat, you're getting the wheat germ as part, as part of it. Some people isolate that and they add it often more as a flavoring than as anything else. Nice. Last time we talked, you and just like me, you enjoyed savory breakfast rather than sweet ones. Is that still the case? Yeah, I have a sort of a breakfast routine that I fell into a number of years ago, and it's got three parts. And the first part is some sort of plant protein. And I find that that just sort of makes me feel good and energetic the rest of the day. And when I say plant protein, what I mean is I'll take some tofu or some tempeh and I'll put it in my nonstick pan. And I'll grill it on both sides and I may have it with a little bit of soy sauce or some ginger or some nutritional yeast. And then the second thing, I've gotten into having some green vegetables in the in, in, for breakfast. I know that sounds funny to a lot of people. Well, it's, I, 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 it doesn't sound funny to me. I've been doing it for 12 years and so is my yes, husband. Here, exactly. Um, broccoli, asparagus, kale, spinach, any of those things. I might spray them with little brags or something like that. And then the third thing, I'll have some sort of carbohydrate. Um, and that's where I'm building glycogen for my run that I'm going to do tomorrow morning. Um, and that can either be fruit like a papaya or some mangoes or any other kind of fruit or a big bowl of oatmeal or some dry cereal or something like that. So the three parts are a plant protein, a green vegetable, and some kind of starchy uh, vegetable or some fruit. And if you're feeling mentally a little bit out of sorts because you're only having some toast uh, or something like that for breakfast, try this and see if you don't feel better. I don't think there's anything weird about vegetables for breakfast. When I've traveled to other countries, that's, it's always been part of a healthy breakfast. It's here that breakfast is basically caffeine, sugar, and flour. So kudos to you. Marianne would like to know, are there foods that can help you avoid anxiety or maybe even treat anxiety? I don't think we fully explored that. I, I, th I think it's a great question. And I think it's sort of at the frontiers of nutrition research now, but I'll, I'll share one thing with you about who 10, 15 years ago, we did a study with Geico, the car insurance company, because our diabetes work funded by NIH had just come out showing that a plant-based diet, a, a low-fat vegan diet, could was, was very effective for improving diabetes and causing weight loss. So our friends at Geico uh, said, let's do a study together. And working with Geico facilities in 10 different cities, we found that you could in implement a healthy diet at work. Everyone got together once a week. They learned how to go vegan. They loved it. It was great. They lost a lot of weight. Their blood sugars got better. But we also looked at anxiety and we looked at depression just because, I mean, you can be at work and you've got the world on your shoulders. And we found that both anxiety and depression tended to get better. And the answer, the question then is why? The short answer is, I don't know, but I'll tell you what I think is that anxiety and depression are two sides of the same coin. Uh, if a person is feeling down and depressed, very often there's something 
it's it's not just that, that you kind of pull the plug on their mood. There's something troubling them, something that is not getting right. Um, and anxiety and depression go together all the time. And to some extent, they although they can be fueled by real life events, let's face it, there's a lot wrong in the world. But the other piece of this is you have a mental chemistry that allows you to kind of surf along the problems of day-to-day -day life. And uh, when we have uh, too much inflammation in our body, particularly from animal products, inflammatory chemicals don't just affect your joints and your, your physical body, they also get into the brain. And depression has an inflammatory component. So if people are on inflammatory diets, they feel crummier. When they're on an anti-inflammatory diet, they feel better. Um, the last thing I'll just mention is you heard me talk about plant proteins. If they're not in your diet, put them in your diet. Start your day with it and start a meal with it. If you're just eating a lot of sugary stuff, a lot of people feel unsupported with that. So if you're having bread, and not that, not, not that bread is terrible, it's okay, but you might need to have, if you're just having starchy food, your, your brain often makes excessive serotonin. And the, although that plays a role in mood regulation, if it's out of balance with the other uh, neurochemicals, you don't feel well. Great. Dr. Barnard, I, I, we have so many more questions, but I want to respect your time. Maybe you'll come back right when the book launches that week, if you like, or Dustin can come make some recipes, whatever I can do to support you. And thank you for all the wonderful work you've done. Well, thank you, AJ. I look forward to our next visit together. And, and thank you, AJ, for all you do. You reach so many people, you inspire them, you give them information, but you know what? You make it fun. And it's been well, a great thing with you. And I try to make it delicious. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnard. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. for board certified urologist, Dr. Ashley Winters. And she's going to talk about how your sexual health predicts your cardiovascular health. You won't want to miss it. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.